In 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14, it tells us that the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And in Acts 13, 22, it says, God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And for me, when I see a scripture like that, I'm thinking, well, what does that mean to be a man after God's own heart or a lady after God's own heart? Have you ever stopped and thought about that before? What does it mean to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? That's what we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to be using the first two kings of Israel to talk about this. And so if you can turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to stay mostly here. 1 Samuel chapter 15. I'll give you a chance to turn there. First Samuel chapter 15 and verse 1. Now this is jumping into kind of uh, not the beginning of Saul's story, but later on after he has become king. And Samuel came to Saul and said, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. So God's going to tell him something to do. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. So he's about, they're about to have this battle against the Amalekites, but we need to understand the context of why. So if you go back and look in Exodus chapter 17, you don't have to turn there to stay in 1 Samuel 15. In Exodus chapter 17 and verse 8, we find out that when Israel is on its way to the promised land, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. And verse 13 tells us that Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. So God gave them victory that way, but that wasn't the end of the story. If you continue and look at verse 14, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered And make sure Joshua hears it. This is important, so important, I want you to write this down and pass it to that person that's going to be in charge after you. Because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Okay, that word blot out, just suck up all the ink off of that page as if it had never happened, as if the Amalekites had never existed. I will completely blot out the name of Amalek under heaven. So Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord. So wait a minute. What's happening here? So the, when the Amalekites are attacking Israel, who are they really fighting against? They're fighting against God. God had promised to bring them to the, uh, the promised land. And so the Amalekites are facing the very throne of God. And it says that the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Okay, so we see a fulfillment of this when the command is given to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And so he acts on this. It says, Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. So they were given this command to destroy everything because this is a judgment by God through the people of Israel executed against the Amalekites. But they chose to spare Agag. They chose to spare the best of the sheep, cattle, and the lambs. Everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. We'll keep all the good stuff. Let's get rid of all the bad stuff. Verse 12 tells us that early in the morning, after God had spoken to Samuel, he got up. And went to meet Saul. But when he goes to meet Saul, he finds out something. He was told this about Saul. Saul has gone to Carmel, 
There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. So I want you to stop and think about this. Man, uh, this wasn't uh, Saul's first battle. He is excited. He's already had victory once, and now he has completely destroyed the Amalekites. He is firmly established as king. The people are looking to him. So the people were able to get some of the plunder, and he was beginning to look really good. And he says, I I guess it's about time for me to get my statue, right? I deserve this, right? Because I am this great king. And so he sets up this statue in his own honor. If you skip to verse 23, you see something that applies here. Arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Arrogance. The arrogance of him. Why was it arrogant for Saul to to put up a statue in his armor? Just stop and think about this. Who wrought the victory that day? God did. He was simply a messenger, simply obeying uh, what God wanted him to do. But yet he claims this, look at what I have done. And so when you do this, it's kind of like the evil of idolatry. Why is it idolatry? Because who becomes God? You. I did this by my power and by my strength. And the people of Israel would look to Saul and say, yes, look at what Saul did, not necessarily what God did did. There was arrogance there. So how many of you got uh, some notes when you first walked in? Everybody get get some? Okay, good. So we're going to learn a little bit about Saul. So on the first point I want you to know about Saul is that he had a selfish hunger. He wanted to worship himself. Uh, Basically putting up the statue is a form of worshiping their self, serving Himself. And basically, Saul's life, he was always looking out for number one, and that one was him. And now, when I think about that, I think about uh, Satan. Remember what Satan said? We see in the Old Testament, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. And Saul is following in this footsteps. He wants to build himself up. It's all about him. So I have a news flash to Saul today. If I could talk to Saul that day, I would give him a revelation. Saul, you're not God, right? You can't save yourself. And I'd say that to all of us too. When we get to that place where we think it's all about what we have done, then we need to realize that we are not God. You know, sometimes we deceive ourselves thinking that we are responsible for all the good things that I did. Man, I studied well at college. I worked hard. Uh, I got that job. And now I am at the place that I always wanted to be because of all that I did. Isn't it easy to kind of, you could fall into that and we can deceive ourselves into thinking that it's everything that we have done. And what happens is we worship ourselves instead of worshiping God. Now, if you were uh, into philosophy, what would you call that? Or humanism. Yeah, it's, it's all about you. And uh, to the humanist, I would say this. If you don't think you need God, then give back his heir. Right? If you don't need God, then give back his reign. Give back his son. And while you're at it, go ahead and give back your body. Because he's the one that created you and made you. Right? Now, I know very well that I am not God. I can't heal the sick. I can't raise the dead. I can't even control all the details in my life. And so I gladly say today, I need God. You know, some people look at Christians and they they feel sorry for us. Oh, you poor, weak-minded Christians. You're still at that place where you need the crutch called God. You ever heard that before? God is a crutch for people that can't make it through life, and so they depend on God. And I'm here, I'll say, I gladly confess, I need God in my life. But He's much more than a crutch to me. He sustains my very life. I I think of scriptures like in Acts chapter 17, verse 28. In Him I live. In Him I move. In Him I have my very being. 
I think of Colossians 1.17 that says of God, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. It means when my life feels like it's falling apart, He is the glue that holds me together. He is the one that holds all of us together. I gladly say that I need God. 1 Samuel 15 and verse 18 continues the story. And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely. This is Samuel addressing Saul. So you're sent on this mission. Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. So notice the description. They are considered wicked. Now just in case somebody's here and saying, well, doesn't that seem really mean that God would do that? Again, let's go back through history. Would anyone be upset uh, with Hitler being destroyed in the time where he is killing people? Think about Sodom and Gomorrah, the wickedness that is perpetuated. The Ninevites and what they were doing to one another and to others. There are times that God is able to make that wise decision on who to be dealt with. So they are called wicked people, these Amalekites. He is told to wage war against them until he had wiped them out. Verse 19, he challenges Saul with this. says, Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? You see, God gave Samuel some wisdom. It wasn't about following God. It was more about the plunder. Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Here's Saul's defense. But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. Matter of fact, I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. So how many of you have kids or have kids before? Just imagine you take them out to eat uh, at a restaurant and they all eat. Maybe they're five or six years old or something like that. You get done eating, and one of the kids says, I'm still hungry. And you notice at the table beside you, this, this other family left. And they didn't eat all of their food. And you, you see your, your son kind of eyeing that food over there. There's some cookies and rolls and all of this good, good food. And being a nice parent, you want to help out in the restaurant. And so you ask your kids, hey, kids, I want you to go and take all of the food and I want you to throw that in the garbage, okay? Clean that table off. And so they say, yes, mom. And then they go and they clean off the table and they pocket the cookies. Yeah. And they start eating the cookies. And mom and dad look at them and say, I told you to completely clean that off. And they said, we did. We completely threw everything in the garbage and ate the cookies. Right? Did they completely do it? No. And in the same way, he did not completely destroy the uh, Malachites. He brought back his prize trophy, the king Agag. He continues his blaming, verse 21. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. What noble purposes. Really because they wanted to cook them there so they could eat them later. Okay, They wanted to satisfy themselves. Verse 22, But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed or to listen to what God tells you to do is better than the fat of rams. You know, there was a t- I was talking to my kids about this. Uh, back in the Middle Ages, there was a time uh, where people sold indulgences. Do you ever, you ever heard about that before? So it was this idea that you could, uh, if you sinned, you could go and pay for an indulgence uh, for however how big your sin is. Maybe you'll get a little bit higher. And then the priest would take your money and give you an indulgence saying, you are now forgiven of your sins. And so basically you could, you could buy your sins away. But what I'm saying here today is you can't buy off God. Your sacrifices doesn't cut it. Some people feel like, hey, you know, I sin, I do this every day, but I'll come to church and I'll write one big old check and then I'll be right in God's sight. But the truth is you can't get one over on God. 
You have to obey him. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination. Those are strong words. Because he disobeyed, it wasn't just a simple act of disobedience. It was actually rebellion. God told him to do something, and he said, No, I am going to do this instead. And that's like the sin of divination. It's like witchcraft. Basically, it is working the will of Satan in that uh, moment. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Because you wouldn't listen to me, now I'm going to not listen to you. Verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, and this sounds like repentance right here. I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instruction. And here's why. I was afraid of the men And so I gave into them. I want you to put this down for your next thing about Saul. Saul had a fear that produced disobedience and wickedness. I want you to stop and and think about some of the things that Saul has done. He's erected the statue to himself. He desires for people to uh, look up to him, to like him. He's relatively new in his kingship. And so... He wants his attention to be him. And now he's worried because all the the spoils of of the victory, they don't get to have. And he's worried that the people are going to revolt against him. Maybe they're not going to treat him like the king that he deserves to be. And so he gives in his fear of what people will do, causes him to disobey the Lord. And this is wickedness. Now, before we judge Saul too harshly, I have a question for all of us. Are we motivated by fear of what people will think of us? Have we ever done some things that maybe we shouldn't have done just because we're afraid of what people will think of us? Are we afraid of losing their affection? Saul chose the people over God. And the question is for us, do we choose people over God? Basically, don't live your life to please others. Live your life to please God. Now, let's go back to the story, 1 Samuel 15 and verse 25. And so we're going to see real repentance. I have a real fake repentance, real fake worship. 1 Samuel 15, 25. Now I beg you, forgive me my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. Doesn't that sound good? He's repenting. He wants to go and worship the Lord. It sounds great until you read a little bit further his motivations. When you go to verse 30, he says again, I have sinned. You're right. Yes, I've sinned. But please, what's those next two words? Honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. What was he concerned about? Man, I'm, after this battle, I'm going to come down. The people are not going to see Samuel with me. There's gonna, they're going to know something is up, like there's a problem, that there's sin. Man, he's got to go with me. We need to go through with the show, Samuel. Come on, let's go. Let's worship the Lord so everybody sees everything is okay in the kingdom. They see me worship God and everything is okay. And notice those key, that key word that he uses, that, that I may worship the Lord, your God. Not, not his God, not my God. It's the Lord, your God. So what I want to put for three there is a fake worship. A fake, superficial worship. And so that, I ask us, is our worship For show. Do we come to church so people will know that we go to church and we do the church thing, the other we're Christians? Do we ever raise our hands because we want people to think that we are a spiritual person? Now, I want to make sure you don't misunderstand me. Uh, Melanie talked about this. There are times that you come into church and 
you don't necessarily feel like worshiping God. Does that mean that you never lift up your hands in moments like that? No, that is a sacrifice of praise. And that comes from the place, God, I, I know I'm struggling right now, but you're still worthy of praise. So that's one thing. But another thing is, is I hope people see, praise the Lord. Anybody hear that? You know, we're, we're trying to get people to look at us to see what great people we are. That is a fake worship. What true worship is, Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Worship is more than the words that we say. It's actually being obedient to God so that when we come and say the words, we've got the actions that back up the words. So what do we see about Saul? This hunger for himself to be honored in front of people. This fear that he's going to lose that place of honor. Matter of fact, later on in his life when he hears about uh, David killing the thousands, uh, tens of thousands compared to his thousands. He gets jealous about that, even tries to kill David, chases him all over. That same fear was producing disobedience and wickedness in him. And we saw just the desire for fake worship, not a real relationship with God. And because of that, God rejected him as king. We see that in 1 Samuel 13, 14. Samuel says, and this is a previous incident, You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command of the Lord. So he did this again earlier. The Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. See, this this desire for self, this fear that motivated disobedience, this fake worship was not the kind of heart that God wanted. The Lord sought a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. We know from Acts uh, 13 verse 22 who that was. After removing Saul, he made David their king, God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. So I began to think, what is it about David that made him a man after God's own heart? And you cannot read the Psalms and not hear the hunger that David has for a relationship with God and to worship the Lord. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 63. And I want to read it to you right now without too much commentary. He says, You, God, are my God. Do you see the contrast between Saul and David? Saul said, It's your God. David says, You are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Do you hear that hunger that David has for the presence of God? I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. What do you hear behind this? That that David loves the Lord and he is receiving love from God and that's better to him than everything that life has to offer. And that's why he sings. That's why his lips glorify the Lord. He says, I will praise you as long as I live. I will follow you faithfully. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. Notice this, I will be fully satisfied. That means, God, you meet all of my needs. I am completely filled in you. As with the richest of foods, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. David saying, I can't not think about you throughout all my day. You're constantly on my thoughts. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you and your right hand upholds me. He knows that God will be there 
for him. You know, have you ever thought about what would our prayer life and our worship life be without the book of Psalms? You know, David wrote at least like 77 of them, possibly more. There's some we're not sure about. If we didn't have those instances where, where David talks about loving the Lord more, you know, more than the, the richest of foods, would our Christianity be a little bit different? Would we be just be, would it all be just a head thing and about us following God without the relationship that's there? We learn about the heart that we're supposed to have from hearing David pour out his heart to God and you hear relationship that's there. And so as we look into the word of God and allow that mirror to look back at us, we ask that question, do we hunger for God? Do we just come to church because it's the right thing to do? Or do we really want to have a relationship with God? And if so, where does that play out? Are we spending time with Him? Are we longing for Him? Do we hunger for God? Second thing I think that plays a role in David being a man after God's own heart is that he had a faith that produced obedience. And this was driven by a desire to please God. I'm going to say that one more time where Saul had a fear that caused him to disobey and get involved in wickedness, David, on the other hand, he had a faith in God that couldn't be matched. And so that produced obedience, and he really wanted to please God. I want to say faith is huge in God's economy. Hebrews eleven six, 6, you know it. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. David believed and had faith in God and in his mighty power, and this propelled him into action. Again, notice what it says in verse 22. And this tells, Scripture often interprets itself. What does it mean to be a man after his own heart? What does the second part say? He will do everything I want him to do. So we see the obedience that's there. And this obedience was motivated by faith. Remember when David faced Goliath? What did he say to King Saul? Or, you know, probably he's thinking about it when he starts to hear the taunts of Goliath over the people of God, putting down God. It's like, aren't you guys going to do anything? Is anybody going to stand up for the Lord? And then he begins to remember. Remember what God did when that lion came, he gave me the power and he he helped me defeat the lion. Remember when that bear came, you know, I went in power and God helped me and I I defeated that bear that's there. And if, if God can use me to do that, then God can help me here defeat Goliath. And so his faith in what God had done and his relationship with God propelled him to say, I'm going to go and fight Goliath and God is going to give me the victory. So when God calls, our faith in Him and desire to please Him should propel us into action. Maybe to help you think about this, what has God done in the past for you and for others? Stop and look back at your life. We're getting close to that Thanksgiving time, so you need to be doing this anyway. Stop and think about what has God done in your life? Maybe you feel like nothing good has happened in my life. Well, If you're really struggling, look here. You see God's fingerprint all over this, the many things that he has done on behalf of you and all the world. What has God done in the past for you and others? Let that propel you. And then maybe you could say, God, what can I do today to bring a smile to your face? You know, wouldn't it be nice if we we started every day like this? We remember what God has done in the past. We're listening and saying, God, is there anything you want me to do today? And maybe we say this prayer to God. God, I really want to please you today. Is there something special that I can do for you? Is there some, someone that I can minister to? Is there something that I can do to show the love of Christ to someone else? God, I want to make you smile. Wouldn't that be a great goal for us every single day? Amen. So what do we see in David? A spiritual hunger. We see a faith that produced obedience, driven by a desire to please God. 
And then lastly, what I would say is part of this equation of what it means to be a man after God's own heart. David had humble worship. Now, some people, when they hear that word humble, they equate that with fear. They think of this little coward over here. I'm humble because I can't beat up anybody, you know, this weak person. But that's not true humility. True humility, it's, it's boldly stating that every good thing that has happened in my life is because of God. I can't take credit for it, but God is the strength of my life. Was David weak? No. He was little. He couldn't even have all the armor on. But he had a humility that, that said that God will give me the victory. And that humility didn't stop him from facing Goliath, did it? No, that humility and trust in God propelled him to do something very great for God. I want to give you one psalm that just, again, shows us a little bit of the praise that, uh, that David had for God. Psalms 101, five verses. It says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him, and praise His name. For the Lord, the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Mel, would you come and... I'd like to sing that song, Creating Me a Clean Heart, at the, the very end. But I want us to look back, and I want you to ask yourself the question, who am I more like? Not me, you. <laughs> who are you more like? Do you find yourself really concerned more with what people think about you? And you're always trying to make sure you're taken care of in your life. Do you kind of have this fear? You're worried about what people think about you. And sometimes that causes you to do things that you know are wrong. Do you come to church and sometimes it, it just feels like a big show to you? If you find yourself in that place, there is a great psalm that I'm going to share with you a few verses before we get done. But then... May this be our prayer. Oh God, may we hunger for you. Make that part of your prayer life in the morning. God, put a hunger in me for more of you. I want to have that kind of relationship that David did with you, where he spent time with you, he praised you, he trusted in you, and it caused him to do great things. Make it be part of your prayer life to remember what God has done in the past and say, God, I want to obey you today. Not just uh, make these sacrifices with words. Lord, I want to live out my faith before you. God, help me to please you, to do something today that will make you smile. And then lastly, Lord, put inside of me a heart of worship where it will just spill out of me that I can't contain my love for you. Lord, may it come out of each and every one of us. Again, if you look at yourself and you say, maybe you find a little bit more in common with Saul, uh, don't despair. David has a psalm just for you. Psalm 51, 10. Not going to read all of it, but there's a few key verses. And you know, David wasn't perfect and Saul wasn't completely bad, but we're looking at some generalizations here. Psalm 51, 10. Create in me a pure heart. Hmm. Let's just stop there just for a moment. Make that your prayer. Lord, create in me a pure heart. Drive away the fear, Lord, that causes us to do wrong things. Create in us a pure heart, O oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. God, give me that willing spirit that that I will do whatever it is that you ask me to, Lord. Don't cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Some of you need to pray that prayer right now. If you are dry, if you're honest with yourself, maybe you've been questioning even God's existence. Remember what we looked at in Hebrews. It says, if... 
Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever comes to him must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if you're in that spot, God, say, God, show me yourself. Make my faith real. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me through those times. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to play a... Uh, a video. This is based on David's life. And then after that, we'll sing a uh, song together. But as we do this, play this song, I want you to begin to ask God to cause you to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. If If you need to confess any of those things that we've talked about today under Saul, feel free. These altars are open to come and meet with the Lord.